Welcome everybody at One Life to Next Gen Sunday. That explains why I'm up here. You know, it's kind of representing all the young, cool looking people. And uh, just, I'm glad I could do that for everybody. Um, actually, it's also, I have to wish you a happy end of summer Sunday. I have to be a downer, but it is. It's kind of, I think the kids are going back to school uh, this week. And I hope you did have a halfway decent summer. I have to say that I did have a life marking moment uh, over the summer, I want to tell you about, but uh, but pretty much it wasn't that much fun of a summer. I uh, we decided we were not going to go on vacation. We decided to use vacation days to transition. Uh, I'm not next gen at all. I'm actually transitioning. We're, my wife and I are downsizing all of our stuff. We're selling a bunch of things. And we're moving to a condo, and it looks like a retirement community. It's not a retirement community, <laughs> but it just kind of looks like one. And most of the neighbors look like they fit right in at a place like that. So, uh, and I'm going to fit right in. Uh, so we're doing that, but at the very beginning of the year, I uh, got to take a trip. It wasn't a vacation trip, but it was a mission trip with Uncharted International. Uncharted International, for those of you who may not know, uh, myself and some other one-lifers uh, several years ago founded this organization for the purposes of helping local churches connect with global work, okay? And so we were doing a number of things in the beginning, and there at the start, I was Admittedly, I was super into it. We were in China and Myanmar and places in Central Asia and Dubai and places like that, which we still are, uh, at least not China. But um, we were just going great guns. A lot of things were happening. And then in one of the countries we were in, it's like everything was going great and then everything stopped almost overnight. And that included friends of ours in that country being killed. Uh, friends of ours being arrested and, and, and others not being allowed in the country. It's just a number of things happened that shut it all down. And if I'm being super honest, I, I, it, it was kind of a moment of disillusionment for me. And so I, I'm still on the board of directors and stuff, and I, but over the years, last few years, I've kind of been putting one foot in front of the other because I believe in global missions, but I'm still kind of walking with a limp, I think, because of that. So I was asked, though, uh, to go uh, with the team from here at One Life to Serbia, the country of Serbia, and also Paris. So I heard Paris and I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Uh, doesn't sound like a lot of people will be getting killed over there for their faith. So uh, no, I went over there. It wasn't a vacation, I promise. But Uncharted has always been about reaching the least reached countries of the world and Serbia and Paris especially qualify for that, okay? So we went over there and our job was just to try to figure out if work should be going on here. Well, we, um, we were given an exercise by our leader of our team, a little devotional exercise. I don't even remember honestly what it was. But there was a moment when I'm walking around downtown Belgrade, Serbia, and I'm on a street corner, and I'm gonna warn you before I say anything more, some of you are skeptics, you're not into the whole church thing, you're just kind of here checking it out. This, was, this is gonna make the needle of your skeptometer go up just a little bit, or your weird meter, or whatever you have going on there, okay, when I say this. But Christian people really believe, and the Bible says, that we have God's spirit within us that leads us. And so I really did, I was standing on that street corner and felt a leading, uh, and it was as, it, as if God said to me very clearly after limping for several years, Brett, um, you, you have given the first part of your life to helping plant One Life Church and helping start up this thing called Uncharted. Spend the next season of your life establishing and developing and, and, and working with these organizations, but here was the key, for the next generation, for the next generation. And it just so happened that I had my son with me on that trip, my wife and my son went, and uh, he's over here at East, he's on a student worship team, and they played right before I got up today, and he told the story, we actually let him get a tattoo, he had to wait till he was 18, I'm still against it, but you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, but, but he went to Serbia, and he, and he chose, and, and, and he and his mom actually got together, they didn't let me in on this, um, but his mom, and, uh, they, they, they came up with this phrase, I can't pronounce it, but it was, it, it's Serbian across his arm, but it means he is greater. And so he went to Serbia and he was walking around as a representative of the next generation and something in that place, something in what he saw made him realize in a new way that he is greater and he wanted it permanently on his arm. And so I was like, uh, okay, you know, as long as you pay for it, that's the deal. That's kind of how that went. So, and that just kind of sealed it for me that this next generation thing matters. And it matters a lot. 
And here's what I'd like to say to West and Henderson and East, our campuses here at One Life. Uh, last week, it was funny, I, I came to, speaking of, of next generation, I came to kind of a senior moment. I came to the moment in my sermon when I was going to quote our church vision statement. Some of you remember this, and I came to it, it was like all fired up and everything, and I went, and it was not there, it was gone. It was, it was, it was literally, I was filing through, I think I quoted Crossroads uh, vision statement, and, and a, the latest commercial I had, it was like McDonald's mission statement, I was kind of going through. I couldn't figure it out, I still didn't know what it was. And so, but I, I've, I've practiced up since then, kind of gotten, I got in the zone, and, and I want to remind you what we said at the, at the beginning of the year, we kind of shifted around to say our vision statement, where we're going, who we are, what we're about, and what we're gonna give ourselves and our resources to are, Here it is, <laughs> planting churches devoted to changing the secular worldview of the next generation. And um, that means something. Now what I wanna do is I wanna give you guys the question, all of you here, and just, you know, if you're under my age, which most of you are, still you're included in this question. I want you to ask yourself over the course of this next few moments as I'm kinda of talking through things, how can I, or how might I in my life, serve, pray for, give to, and speak into the next generation? Now, let me give you a quick definition. How can I do that? Wherever you are, a definition of next generation. Now, when we say next generation, officially, we mean as an organization, first and foremost, that's kids and students. That really is kind of birth all the way up through college. It's kind of that, that thing. But it's not simply them. Don't panic, all right? For some of us who are old enough, it basically means those who are about 15, 18 years younger than you. How can you intentionally and proactively and with a mindset that's really fixed on that, how can you pray for, get, serve, give to, speak into the next generation? What can you do to do that? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend my time giving you why you ought to do it. I'm gonna give you some hows towards the end. Now why is simply this. We just, uh, we finished up the summer with this uh, a series called Mixtape. And Mixtape is a study of the Psalms in the Bible. And we encourage you to pray the Psalms. And we taught on the Psalms and sing the Psalms and get familiar with the Psalms. And I quoted the great, Mar uh, the great, uh, ref uh, the great, I quoted somebody who was really, really great. <laughs> And everybody went, wow, that was great. His name was Martin Luther. It wasn't Martin Luther King Jr., it was Martin Luther. Martin Luther, great reformer. He was a great reformer. This is amazing. I, I, feel, I, I, think, the next, I think the message I'm getting is the next generation needs to start doing what I'm doing right now. You know? <laughs> Starting to feel that way a little bit. Um, but uh, Martin Luther said about the Psalms, he said this, the reason the Psalms are so important for you to pray them and know them and be familiar with them is they're, they're a lyrical form. They're, they're the Bible in miniature. They're a lyrical form of what the Bible says over and over and over again. So the themes in the book of Psalms are really the themes of the entire Bible. So you can know them and pray them. And this thing of generations, this idea of generations, the, the way the psalmist viewed life was they saw God is telling a story. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it will have an end. And they saw their place in life as having a, a, a role in the plot line. And so they saw that intentionally. They saw they were supposed to look back and honor and listen to and receive from generations that went before. And then they were supposed to pass on to and give to the generations that were to come. And they saw this consciously. And I think that's important for us. I'm going to give you a few samples of the kind of thing I'm talking about in the Psalms. Psalm 45, 17 says this. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Psalm 71, 18 says this. I, lo I love the way it's phrased here. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Here's another one. My people, hear my teaching, listen to my words of, uh, of, of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things from of old. Jesus, it talks about him doing that. 
Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their, our ancestors' descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. There was a consciousness inside their mind that they were a part of a story. And that's how they viewed the world. Sometimes we narrow ourselves to just our life and our generation and our time and everything else. And the psalmist, and therefore the entire Bible, calls you to have an active mental view of life that says there's those behind me that I need to honor and receive from and those, befo- uh, th- those after me that I need to give into and to do it consciously and intentionally. Now, the main why besides that that I want to give you today is just one, okay? So get set because it's going to be a good one, a great one as a matter of fact. I'm sorry. Um, here's the Why? It shows, if you do this, you're living with a truthful perspective. If you do this intentionally, consciously, actively, receive from the old and give to the next, it shows you're living with a truth, truthful perspective. You know how that works? <laughs> One of my favorite preacher moments ever, I don't know if I've mentioned this lately or not, but Billy Graham, who passed away uh, not very long ago, was given the Congressional Gold Medal by uh, Congress. And it's, uh, along with the Presidential go- uh, uh, Medal, Gold Medal, is like the highest honor you can get for a civilian, back in 1996. And I watched the video of this, it's great. Uh, Bill Clinton was a president then, President Clinton was there, and Al Gore was there, and Newt Gingrich was there, the room was filled, it was in the Capitol Rotunda. And they invited Billy Graham to speak, he received this great award. And in his speech, he said, you know, I've been to this place many times, and I've walked these halls, and I've seen all these statues around of all these great Americans, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the the whole group. And he said, I've often thought to myself, you know what they all have in common? They're all dead. And yeah, and and there, everybody (laughs) nervously chuckled. They're all dead. That's what they all have in common. And then he followed it with this. And we will soon join them. Billy Graham, ladies and gentlemen. What do you think of that? See, there was a consciousness, and that sounds like a buzzkill, and I announced a while ago that summer's over. Now I'm here to tell you, you're going to die, okay? So everybody, let's praise the Lord. Woo! You know, that's kind of... But the consciousness in the scriptures, in the Psalms, is they were actively aware of the fact that they were going to die. And it wasn't, I'm sure it was a bummer, I'm sure it was a drag, but at the same time, they didn't push it away. They looked at their life as, I had a beginning, I have a middle, and I'm going to. It's an absolute guarantee that every single person within the hearing of my voice, myself, all of us, every celebrity that you know of, every great sports star that's right now is in the the zone, you're LeBron James and you're fighting with the president or whatever, and you're, you're, you're going back and forth that way. Whoever it is, whatever celebrity is, musician, no matter how good looking they are, successful they are, or seemingly indestructible they are. It's a fact that the psalmist and the people that had a biblical worldview knew 200 years from now, we're all have names on gravestones that people will drive by on their way to work and not think too much about. Praise the Lord, right? When you know that, listen to what the, what the scripture says in 1 Peter. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. In other words, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've all seen it, and the flowers spring up. And they're awesome, and they're wonderful, and they're great, and it's, it, it, it's incredible. But then they fade away. They go away. And we are supposed to see that as a reality, not to be depressing, 
Because first of all, when you place your faith in, in, in Christ, you have the promise of the resurrection, that, that the end of the story is not death and then it's over. The end of the story is going to have another chapter that God has added and he's guaranteed that if you're in Christ, you're going to be resurrected from the dead. So therefore, nothing you do here can be in vain when you do it for Christ. That's a great, great promise. But still, most generations will go through this experience of my life will end. And if I'm facing into that, I need to rethink, okay, what am I going to do? How am I consciously going to respond to that basic fact? Now, the first way you ought to respond to it is remember that if you die and you're outside of Christ, you are going to appear before the God of the universe and you are going to be judged and you are going to be condemned. So you need to come to Christ and face that reality full on because it's going to happen. You're going to get your shot. That's the first response you ought to have. The second response is once I have faith, once I'm in, okay, how can I consciously, intentionally see the past, honor the past, and receive from them and give to the next? Because I'm not going to be here forever. That's a great why. Okay, I don't mean to give his age, but I think it's about 63 or 4. He's over 60, okay? His name is Bob Seymour. He's a guy that has been in our church. A number of you know him, some of you do not. Um, he, he went premature gray when he was 20, so I think he's always kind of looked a little 60. You know, I can say that because he's like 10 years, he's 10 years older than me. I do know that part, okay? Just keep that in mind. There are, I don't think there's another personality that I personally know of who does this more effectively. You know, I make fun of his age, but he has more energy than about five 20-year-olds put together. Most of us think he doesn't sleep at all, ever. And he knows everybody except about four people in the world. Okay, something like that. And they're just like Eskimos that are hiding somewhere, all right? He knows everybody else. But I've watched Bob, and I watched it happen yesterday, give his life to the next generation. His energy and his wisdom and his prowess. And he goes around and literally, and, and, over, and over in Henderson was a great example yesterday. On the east end of that uh, of, of that community, it's kind of under-resourced, it's that kind of part of town where there's a little bit of struggle and all that financially and all the rest, and he's given the last several years to just building something that is called the Audubon Kids Zone. And what they do is they help kids who may not otherwise have a chance grow up to go into college, change the trajectory of their life through education and everything else. Just devoted himself to that. And yesterday they had this great big party, they brought a dentist in, and they, they were helping the kids get ready to get back to school and firing them up after school, someone with experience and life and hope. We mentioned last week, there was a woman by the name of Amy Higgins. She passed away. We featured her story along the way. She passed away just, uh, about a week and a half ago. And what was interesting about her, when you look at Amy's life, she was one of those people that had the rare privilege and difficulty of knowing for a fact her death was imminent. So all of us think, well, my death is, you know, when I'm 112, I'm going to die in my sleep and all that sort of stuff. But she was, she, she knew it was coming. So it was, it was worthwhile watching her. And it's so interesting. She even, and, and there's nothing wrong with having regular funerals, but she didn't have a regular funeral. You know why? Because she wanted to, to uh, donate her body to science to help someone else. Why? Because she had a perspective that started thinking someone's coming. And she wasn't worried about it. She's like, I'm Michelle. I'm going to be with Jesus. Someone else can aid from that. She was thinking about that stuff consciously. She continued to serve in our church all the way up till she literally just couldn't do it. Just, just didn't have the physical capacity to help. That's a great why. There's lots of whys. But have a truthful perspective that says, my life is not always going to be here. Am I just going to grab it all for myself? Or am I going to consciously and intentionally pray for, give to, speak into, serve the next generation? And let me give you a how. There's a great passage in Psalm 145 that gives us kind of insight into the how. Listen to what it says. I will exalt you, my God, the King, it starts. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and, behold, and, and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. 
They tell of the power of your awesome words, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. One generation commends your works to another. What's the job? What are we supposed to do? If I'm conscious of my eventual passing, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to commend the works of God to the next generation, consciously and intentionally. What does that mean? I've been pondering that a lot. And I think there's, there's in, in some sense, it's one of those things where we are supposed to make sure that they know the content of the Bible. But the more I read that, the more I look at it, and it's in the, it's in the form of a psalm, and it's in the form of this, this thing that there's more to it there. I see something else going on. They will commend your great works. In other words, we need to make sure that kids know, you know, that, that uh, the, the story of the, of the Red Sea parting. We need to make sure we know the, the Daniel and the lion's den kind of stuff. But I'm convinced that this psalm is not necessarily talking about simply copying the information to make sure it gets to another generation. The generation now, you can go on your phone right now and go to the U version, Y-O-U version of the Bible, and you can get pretty much any English translation of the Bible ever printed right there on your phone. So they can have that. They can hear the greatest preachers on YouTube. They can, they can go and they can get access to the Word of God. So how do I, how do you commend his works to the next generation? What does that look like? And I'm convinced, think about this. When you were growing up, what did you look for? Who were the adults that really impacted you? We asked this question in a leadership class that we do. Name an adult that impacted you and why they did it. What was, what was it about them that did it? You know what people invariably say? I've done these, these surveys a ton. They were the real deal first. And number two, I knew they cared for me. They were the real deal, and I knew they cared about me. That was it. I could watch their life, because see, what every generation needs to see is not just someone who can quote the story of the Daniel and the lion's den. What we all look for is, I know you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, but it has impacted your life, and you've walked it, and you have faith, and you have life, and you can tell stories about how God has done amazing things. Let me give you one example. Uh, uh, this past summer, uh, my, uh, I had an aunt that passed away. She was in her late 70s, and uh, uh, they asked me to speak at her memorial. And her husband, my uncle, w- I was with him and, and her sisters and daughter and everything, and I was a- just asking about her life and things. And my uncle said this. He introed it this way. He said, no one believes me when I say this. So I perked up. I'm like, well, this ought to be good, you know. He said, we were married just under 60 years. They just missed their 60th anniversary. He said, in 60 years, she never said a cross word to me. And I said, you're right. I don't believe you. <laughs> but then he came back, tears running down his cheeks. He said, it's true. Now, I know some of you, I, I had some of my other aunts come to me afterwards and said, I wish you hadn't even told that story kind of raise the bar a little high for the rest of them. Most of us have already blown that deal, you know. We said cross words, you know, a honeymoon. You know, just, we all know that. But I said, I don't believe you. And he said, but tears running down his cheeks. He said, he, he said, I said, I know you inspired her to say cross words, right? Oh, yeah. Here's what she would do. She would walk in the other room and she'd pray. And then she would come out and I knew she was in there praying about me on to God about me. And she came and she wouldn't come out until she'd be, she could say things with kindness. And that was the word that everybody defined her as. Kind, kind, kind. What did you say about my Aunt Sharon? She was so she was kind. She was the most kind person I've ever met. But you know what they also said about her? She was a student of the word of God. They said she's, she didn't just read her Bible every day. She literally studied it. She had journal after journal after journal after journal that she would write out longhand inside. She studied the Word of God. That's what I'm talking about. People could say, she wasn't just, you ever met someone who studied the Bible? You could tell they never let the Bible study them. They ended up just being jerks because all they did was just puff up with, with a bunch of knowledge. When you can study your Bible and then go into another room and get before God before you say another word to your husband, That's what just made me think God is real, he's alive. That is commending his works to the next generation. I had another friend went off to a 
went off to Indiana University, grew up in a Christian home, got there, and it was in the late 60s, all this upheaval on campus, all this intellectual challenge to his faith. He said, I was about to slip away. I mean, it was, I was just getting bombarded. Everything I ever believed was just getting creamed. And he said, you know what, for the longest time, what kept me from going over the edge, here's what kept me from going over the edge. I knew what my parents had was real. I knew what my parents had was real. Whew. People are looking for the authentic. That's what commends his work to the next generation. Does that mean you gotta be perfect? No. It just means you, you, you get God's word inside your heart and inside your life and you live it out as an audience of one and just let your light shine and then just have an eye. That's what I'm praying for. God, give me eyes for these little kids that run across the lobby and they're being annoying just like I was annoying when I was that age, getting into things they're not supposed to be in and all that sort of stuff. But give me eyes to see. And give me a life that exudes care. I know of couples in our, in our church that are inviting, again, generations, not just little kids. It can be those who are about 15 years behind you. They're opening up their homes because they've raised kids. Now, we have a lot of young families here. A lot of you have already raised your children. And you learn some hard, 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 hard lessons along the way that I guarantee you there's young couples that would love to hear. Bring them into your home. My wife and I have had a blast inviting students, with just college and high school students, into our home. It's fascinating. Some of you need it just to break you out of your weird paradigms you've got going. You're a little too conservative. They'll, they'll, they'll cure you of some of that stuff. You're like, I don't know the answer to that question. Ah, you, know. you need that. But your main job is just be a real thing. Be a student of the Word of God and commend His works to the next generation. And that's what it means to serve in our kids' ministry or formally lead, you know, a, a group through our high school ministry or student ministry or anything like that. But some of it just needs to be a cultural thing. Here's how we're going to close out today. We have um, our creative department did a great job with this. They, we have a student ministry that they always ask for their prayer request. And then adult leaders are sent these prayer requests. But what we decided to do is let you see what those prayer requests really look like in real life. Because, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you to do a couple things during this piece you're about to see. First, remember what it was like to be in middle school. And just kind of appreciate what they're going through. And then secondly, across all of our campuses, use it to spur on your prayers. Pray for the things that you're going to see on the screen because they'll, they'll, they'll impact you by, just by uh, the observations that they're making, the things that they're walking through. And then just use the rest of the prayer time as we're going to give back to our campuses here in a moment to say, God, how can I serve, give to, pray for, speak into the next generation? Watch this. Thank you. 